recording. So I am recording right now. I remember to click the button. <clears throat> All right. So uh, we have a pretty packed day today in the lecture、uh, because you know, we are now getting into stuff that is a little bit less intuitive,、um, but at the same time, you know, it is also relating a lot. To what we have talked about already so far, so I think it's going to be a good exercise to kind of check whether we understand the material already introduced so far. And if the answer is no, then you know the、um, what John was just talking about, the RAD program. You know, I think that is actually a really good option for a lot of people. So this is an outline of you know, what we're going to talk about today.、Uh, we are. Focusing on the R function and the C function, perhaps you know, maybe we would have time to talk about you know the OR operator versus the you know, arithmetic addition, but I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not sure how far we can go. So we'll talk about the R function and the C function for base two, and then we'll talk about how we can use a truth table to look at the results of R and C when we are only deal with, dealing with base two. And then we'll take a look at you. Know, can we use Boolean operators to do the same thing? Because the bottom line is we want to translate everything to something that we can implement using transistors. Because computers are made out of transistors.、Um, you know that used to be not entirely true because your hard drive has mechanical components. It has got a platter. It has got motors and so on. <laughs> These days, <laughs> there's no such thing as a hard drive anymore because you know almost every computer has. An SSD, which is you know, just semiconductor, which basically is just a fancy word to say transistors. Okay, now they're kind of special transistors, but nonetheless, they are still you know, transistors of sorts. All right. So, in order to get a good start you know, with today's class, the a thorough understanding of the material that we have already talked about on Monday is essential. Okay, so this is a good test of whether you know we got all the material on Monday you know, or not. All right. So what we'll do is I'm do a, I'm I'm going to do a really really short recap of what we talked about on Monday, and I'm going to use my own notes here, okay? Because it's already written here. The most important part is here. So we talked about the C function, you know, as a function in the C programming language.、Uh, all it does is to you know, look at the sum between x and y. The parameters x and the parameter y, they are basically representing a single digit in in this case base ten. In other words, we know the range of x. It has to be from zero to nine. We know the range of y. It also has to be going from zero to nine. So, with that limitation, if I look at the sum of those two values, if it is greater than or equal to ten, then the result of the sum can no longer be represented by a single digit, and we return a one because now we have a carry of one. And then, likewise, we have an R function. So the R function takes care of the other part of single-digit addition. X once again is a digit in base ten, which goes from zero to nine, and same the same applies to Y. But in this case, we want to figure out what I would call the single-digit sum between X and Y. To give you an example, six plus seven has a single-digit sum of three and a carry of one.、Um, Three plus four, okay, is has a single digit sum of seven and a carry of zero. So are we doing okay so far with that description? Okay, all right. So we are reconnecting to what we talked about on Tuesday already. So also on Tuesday, you know, I said, oh, I can cover you know binary addition in five seconds because it only takes five seconds to change this ten to a two. And also to change this ten to a two. So in that case, you know, everything that we have talked about so far, the relationship between the Q and the X Y you know, bits, the relationship between the S and the Q and K bits,、um, and also the relationship between the K and the X Y Q K bits, that relation, those, re those relationships do not change. So all we are changing is just. How we compute R and C, and if we do not shoot for Boolean operators, all we are doing here is to say, oh, the base has changed from ten to two. 
Okay? So now what we will do is we are taking a closer look at what is that going to do. So the nice thing about binary is we only got two possible values or two possible digits per you know, position, or two possible values per digit. That would be the best way to say it. Zero and one, okay? So we'll say, okay, we'll look at x as an independent variable, y as an independent variable, and we'll focus on c of x, y first, okay? And let me see if I can overlay. <clears throat> let me see. Do, 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 do here and then we'll move this one slightly to the right hand side so we can see the function actually like so and then oh I need to turn off my notification do not disturb there we go all right so now we say you know x is a binary digit which means it can only be zero or one y can also only be zero or one so we have four possible ways to combine the zeros and one from both x and y. And remember, we are changing the 10 here to a two. So can someone tell me what is the value of c of zero, zero, when what is highlighted here is now a two? I mean, you know, this one is pretty easy. What should that be? A zero. A zero, okay, so put a zero here. What about when x is one and y is zero? Do a zero. What happens when x is a zero, y is a one? That seems pretty boring. What about the last one? When x is a one, y is also a one. Then we finally get a one. Okay. Do we have any questions about this truth table? Heck, is that a really a truth table? Because you know, we are still dealing with numerical values, zeros and ones. But that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at this is to say, oh, it's a truth table. Zero is false, one is true. Okay, There's no reason why we cannot look at zero as both the numerical value zero and also you know, the, the value of false as a Boolean value. Okay, So when you look at this table and I say, uh, look at this as a truth table. Can you recall a, uh, an operator? Okay, I will give you, you know, the format of the whole thing. X, you know, some kind of operator Y that will give me exactly the same result. So X, some operator Y will still give me exactly 0, 0, 0 and a 1. Yep. Not if and only if here is a much simpler Boolean operator that we know from CISP 360, not even 440. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. Yep. It is ampersand, ampersand, okay, or logical and, okay? So that would do this, the same thing. So now we have solved one problem, okay? Because we have solved the problem of how can we implement the C function without using arithmetic addition and without using arithmetic comparison? Whew. Okay, it's just, it's just regular AND. And we already know regular AND can be done using NAND, and we already know that NAND can be done using two P transistors and two N transistors. So, okay, this is not a problem. We know how to do this, we got this. So the next question is about the R. So we have, once again, another truth table. And this time, I'm going to use the usual way that x is the one that has you know, 0, 0, 1, 1. y is the one that has 0, 1, 0, 1. So now we say, what about the R of x, y? So R of x, y is defined here. Okay, Remember, we are modding 2 and not 10 anymore. So can someone tell me what is? 0 plus 0, the whole thing, mod 2. Zero. 0, very good. What about 0 plus 1 mod 2? 1. You get a 1. 1 plus 0 mod 2 one. is also a 1. And then 1 plus 1 mod 2 zero. is a 0. Okay. 
So this time, we, go look, we look at this and go like, hmm, if I were to use a single operator to do this, it's not quite as easy because you have not been introduced to this operator in CISP360. It is called exclusive OR. This is the exclusive OR operator that will give you exactly the same truth table. So I will write it down as the exclusive OR. Okay, exclusive OR looks like a plus, except it has a circle around it. That is the symbol of exclusive OR. Or you can just spell it out. <clears throat> there are two ways to spell out exclusive OR. Some people spell it out as EOR. You know, the E stands for exclusive. And most, more often, people just call this ZOR because the X you know, stands for exclusive. So you can use any one of these representations if you ever need to write down an answer and say it is exclusive OR. I will accept all three you know, notations to represent exclusive OR. Now, it's not entirely true that C++ does not have exclusive OR. It does have an operator that is using the caret symbol on the keyboard. But that is bitwise exclusive OR and not logical exclusive OR. So in this context, it's not exactly applicable. So I would kind of refrain from using the caret symbol to represent exclusive OR. OK. So exclusive OR as an operator gives you exactly the same result. <clears throat> but then we do not know how to translate exclusive OR into NAND gates because we never talked about it. Okay, hmm. Then what should we do? Well, as it turns out, there's a long-hand way to express exactly the same truth table, but using only the logical operators that we are already familiar with. So that would be the negation of x um, and y, and then the whole thing or x and the negation of y. Oh, okay. I need to move it back because I don't need to show this part anymore, so I can just kind of move the other part back. All right, so move this back here. Yeah, this would be a good place. There we go. So this rather long and cumbersome expression will give you exactly the same truth value. I will give you one example, and you guys can work out the rest. Okay? So we'll we'll pick the second row where x is zero and y is one, meaning x is false, y is true. If x is false, then not false is true. Y is already true. So now we have true and true, right? So we have figured out the left-hand side of the logical OR is true already, and I say, I'm done. Because it's a regular OR, if at least one side is true, I don't even need to bother to look at the other side. Okay, so I'm just giving you one example. I would encourage all of you to work out the entire thing for all four of these new combinations, just so that you have a little bit of exercise you know, to work out the value of Boolean expressions on your own. Are we good so far? All right, so we'll just go ahead and say, yeah, well, if tech was is right, then you know, it will give us exactly the same thing. But what is the bottom line? Well, the bottom line is, this is just logical not, this is logical and, logical or, and then logical and, and logical not. All of those can translate into NAND gates, and NAND gates can translate into a circuit using two P, gate, two P transistors and two AND transistors. In other words, we can implement this truth table, we can implement R of XY using transistors. That's the bottom line. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So now the question is, if that is the case, um, how do we build a circuit to perform addition? There's one more little issue here, okay? The one more little issue here, I'm just gonna write it here, um, is ki plus one is the C of xi, yi, plus the C of uh, qi, ki, okay? This is a part, you know, this is in the notes already. This is in the module. So we, we also talked about this on Monday. But this plus here is addition. It is not logical or, it is not a logical operator. 
So even though C by itself can be implemented using logic gates and transistors, and we still have a problem of how do I combine the results of two C functions? Each C function is just logic is, is a logical expression, it's just regular AND. But how do I combine the results of two logical ANDs? So that becomes my only problem, okay, before I can implement this entire thing using logic sim and just logical circuitry. All right. So are we still doing okay so far? Okay, excellent. So the next thing I want to do is to take a look at the differences between logical OR and arithmetic addition. So now we say, okay, so this X and this Y has nothing to do, do with the numbers that we're adding. I'm just using these as variable names in order to complete this discussion. So X is Boolean. It can either be zero or one. Y can also only be zero or one. And then we have X regular or Y. We have zero here, one, one, one here. And then what about X plus Y? Then we have zero, one, one, and a two. Okay, does that make sense? The only role, the only time it makes a difference whether we are adding or whether we are oring is when X and Y are both ones. So let me highlight the row that we are talking about here. This is the only row that is giving us trouble. Okay, because if I say I really want to do everything using logical gates um, or logical operators, this is the one row that is preventing me from doing that. The other three rows are fine. I can just use a logical OR. So that means if I can show that this will never happen, then I can use logical OR instead of addition. Does that make sense? Okay. Does, does everybody understand where we are heading, what I'm trying to do? Okay. Is to replace that addition with a logical OR. That is what I'm trying to do. Okay, and in order to do that, I have to show that you know, I cannot have the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the OR, uh, the, of the operator, being ones at the same time. Only up to one of them will be a one. Okay, so I'm just going to re-quote uh, the expression here. K of I plus one is the C of XI, YI, plus, okay, this is still a plus at this point, C of QI, KI. So I have to show that it's okay for both of these, you know, the C of XIYI and the C of QI, KI, it's for, okay for both to be zeros, okay? You know, it happens. Uh, it's okay for one of them to be a one and the other one to be a zero. It is not possible for both of them to be ones. That's what I want to prove. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So the question is, how? How can we prove that? Well, the key is Q of I is defined using X and Y. That is our key. Because if we have XI, YI, QI, and also KI, and they're all independent variables, then we have a problem. Fortunately, Q of I is not independent to XI, YI. Okay? Now, if you're thinking, oh, yeah, I know that because I know exactly how Q of I is defined from the lecture on Monday or because I read the notes, you know, great, okay? That means you, know, you are you're catching up with the lecture and also the content of this class to the point that I can build additional concepts without having to recap stuff, okay? On the other hand, if you're saying, well, I kind of recall that QI depends on XI, YI, but I can't quite remember how they're related, I go like, hmm, okay, maybe just a, just a little bit more review, especially on the definitions of the terms, would be helpful, okay? And especially if you say, but I know where to find it, great, okay? We still don't have a problem. For people who are thinking, I have no idea how Q of I relates to X, I, Y, I, I'm concerned, okay? So I just want to express that because, you know, uh, we just have the red, you know, person coming in. You know, you know, to recommend the program, you know, because just because we read something doesn't mean we are understanding or we are incorporating what we are reading into our minds. 
Okay, so there are special techniques of reading. You know, like taking notes, making sure that we really understand the underlying meanings of everything, and that program can help. All right. So for this time, I'm just going to do this. Okay, I'm just going to remind everybody how Q of I is defined. This is how Q of I is defined. So that means in reality, we really only have three independent variables: x i, y i, and then k i. Those are all independent variables. But Q of I is really just an expression using x i, y i. Are we good so far? All right. So now we're going to write a kind of longer truth table. So we have x i, y i. And then Q of I being you know, the R of X I Y I, and then we have K I also being an independent variable. And then we'll take a look at what happens. You know, what are the actual possible combinations? So this time X I will be zero 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 one 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 one, and then Y I is going to be zero zero one one zero zero one one. And the k of i is just alternating, which is zero one, zero one, zero one, zero one, because these are the three independent variables. Then what about q i? Well, we kind of know how to compute q of i. It is just the exclusive or between x i and y i. So we can just say, hmm, okay, we know how to do this. Just looking up the truth table from the previous page, we can now say, oh, that's a zero. That's a zero. That's a one. That's a one. That's a one. That's a one. That's a zero, and that is also a zero. Are we okay so far? Okay. So now we use this. Okay. We use now we have figured out the, all the ways to combine x i y i q i and k i. Now we can go ahead and compute the c of x i y i. The C of Q I K I. Okay, so we'll do this really, really step by step. So X of X I Y I, and then the C of Q I K I. This one is easy. You know, the C of X I Y I is relatively easy. Uh, so this is zero, 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 and then we have a one and a one. Are we doing okay so far? Because only in the last two rows that x i y i are both ones, and we need both x i y i to be ones in order for the logical and to be a one. Be good, okay? So now we work out the other one, okay? So now we look at q i k i. So um, to focus, you know, let me use the mouse pointer to help you focus. So now we are looking at these two columns, because one column is q i, the other column is k i. So we look at these two columns and go like, hmm, that's false. Uh, that's false. That's false. That's true. That's false. That's true. And then we have false, false. Okay. I think that's correct. Uh, I can always double check. And we got one and one here. And therefore, we have a two here. And then... We also have true, true, and that's why we have a true here. All right, so now we look at this and go like, do you see these two columns, the last two columns or the two columns to the right-hand side? Do you see those two being ones at the same time? So you just look at every single row. Okay, let's be careful. Zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, zero. They do not. They they cannot be once once at the same time. So that means oh, we can use logical or instead of the addition. In other words, I can now go back here and I'm going to pick a different color just to be, just to highlight here what we are doing here. So now we can say ah, we don't need that. We just we can do this whole thing using a logical or. Woohoo! Finally, I can do everything using. Logical operators. You guys do not seem too excited about that whole thing, but it really is exciting because now I can perform addition, multi-digit addition using logical gates.
which means I can now implement everything using transistors. I'm just going to pause a little bit here and make sure that you guys can catch up with your writing and also, you know, with, you know, just letting the, all that information to sink in and see if you have any questions. Because thinking about whether there's a question to ask is one of the best way to exercise what you have just learned. Because you're both confirming what you're learning and also going through what you have just learned at the same time. It's also one of the, you know, the value of an in-person class. Because with an online class, especially an asynchronous one, you don't get to do that. I mean, you know, reading is good, but it's a completely passive process. No questions, okay? So this can actually be considered a mathematical proof that we can just replace the addition using an or, okay? There's no, there's no wiggle room, okay? You know, I did not miss a single possibility where, oh, but Tech, did you think about that? Yes, I did. Yeah, we, we thought of all the possible cases. And the key to this proof here is to understand the Q of I depends on X of I and Y of I. That is the key to this entire thing. All right, so are we doing okay? All right, so now that we are doing okay with this, the next thing we'll do is to say, hmm, let's try to make a circuit out of all of these things, okay? So we want to build a circuit for, let's say, adding three bits to three bits, okay? And we'll see what we can, how we can do this. All right, so what we can now do is to say, you know, how do we, we're going to build a circuit, okay? I will do this in, I'll just go ahead and do it in LogiSync, because I think, you know, once we see the circuit, we can actually play with it, and we can actually see how it works. So I will do this in LogiSync, and give me a second here, I'm running this from the command line. This is LogiSync. There we go. Okay, let me put this on the screen that you guys can see. All right. All right, so the construction of this is, um, if I want to make this easier to read, you know, and it scales and all kinds of stuff like that, then I'm going to build it up using uh, smaller circuits. So I go to project and I say add circuit. The first thing I'm going to add is what we call a half adder. Okay. So the first circuit I will build is called a half you know, adder. So the half adder is basically looking at XY, you know, just the XY in this case only refers to the input pins. So we have two input pins, okay, one is X, one is Y. Okay, that is. And I'll label these right away so that we can actually refer to those. So we got X and then we got Y. And then we'll have two output pins one is representing the C of these two, so C of XY, and then the other one is going to represent the R of XY. Okay, so this is our R of XY. So I haven't really done the circuit yet. I, I have just defined the interface to the circuit, but I haven't really you know, defined the guts of the circuit. Yet. But you look at this and go like, oh, but we know how to do this. Um, the C is really just a logical AND of the two inputs. Okay, so we'll go ahead and pick out an AND gate. So they're all under the gates, you know, um, category. So you pick out an AND gate, and it's going to give you something that you really can't use right away. So we have to uh, do a few changes here, turn it into a narrower form, and only have two inputs instead of five inputs. Because you're having inputs that are not used, is not a good idea. That is always a bad idea. All right, so we just connect the output of the AND gate to C of XY, and then connect X to one of the two inputs of the AND gate, and then connect Y to the other uh, AND gate here. Okay, there we go. 
All right, so that's done. Okay, you know, this is how the C function is computed in a circuitry. It's just using a logical AND gate. Okay, this is the symbol of a logical AND gate. Um, it looks like this. So when you look at this, you know, it really is just saying C of X, Y equals to the conjunction of X and Y. Okay. So now we are going to tackle the more problematic one, which is R of X, Y. So R of X, Y can be expressed as just exclusive OR, and we do have an exclusive OR gate. The exclusive OR gate is doo -doo -doo -doo, it's the OR with a bar to the right-hand side. There we go. So the exclusive OR gate is right here. So let's pretend that we do not have an exclusive OR gate, and we have to build the whole thing up using the, you know, the gates that we already know. Well, that's not too bad, okay? So I'm just going to use the uh, comment tool here to remind myself what is how exclusive OR is done, okay? So exclusive OR is the negation, oh, wrong kind of paren. No, it is the right kind. Okay, that dot is making me think it's a brace, but it's not. Okay, so we have negation of x and y, and then the whole thing OR with um, x and the negation of y. Okay, so this is what I need to build. Okay, so this one is a little bit more complex. Okay, a little bit more cumbersome, but I think we can do it. So we just pick out a regular OR gate, like so, and then we make it a narrower one and limit the input to only two pins, like so. So this is taking care of the final operation. Okay, the OR is the final operation. So now we have to figure out, so what are we ORing? Well, we are ORing the results of two ANDs. So now we pick out the AND gate, but instead of doing that, I'm just gonna pick out this one and say duplicate. So I have one and then I have two here. So the one thing, the first thing we know is, you know, the two outputs of this AND gate, they all have to go to the input of the OR gate. So now we basically say, take the result of the AND and we are gonna do an OR of those two results. So what are we ending? Hmm. Well, we're ending the negation of X here, and then we end, you know, and then we have the negation of Y over here. So you can use a NOT gate if you want to. So the NOT gate is just doing negation. The output is the logical negation of the input. That all, that's all it does, okay? But it is cumbersome, okay, to use the NOT gate. Because when you look at the AND gate you know, properties, there are certain things that are kind of interesting. Okay, so let me switch back here and oh, escape. Or can I just click this? Nope. Okay, get rid of this. Click on this. Come on, there we go. So when you look at the specification of an AND gate, it has some of the usual regular stuff that we kind of expect, like facing. Okay, you can rotate the AND gate any way you want so that it looks nice, okay? Okay, kind of important, but not super important in this case. Uh, the number of data bits, okay? So the next lab is about multi-bit gates, okay? But in this class, we're still dealing with just a single bit. That's fine. Uh, gate size is just you know, how it looks, okay? So if you don't mind it looking like gigantic when it doesn't need to be gigantic, you can make it gigantic. Uh, number of inputs, you know, that's just you know, the number of input pins that are all being ended together. So we're going to stick with an input number of two for now, because you know, most of the time when we write you know, something ampersand ampersand something else, there are two things that we are ending. So that that's kind of natural to use two as the number of inputs. Uh, output value is zero versus one. I don't even know what the alternatives can be. Oh, okay, we are not dealing with floating yet, so you know, forget about the other options. Label is just the name, you know, so it, it appears. And oh, this is just a font size here, which is also not important. So the last two are important. As it turns out, you can say, oh, I just want to negate you know, one of the inputs. So here we have the option of saying, oh, let's go ahead and negate the bottom one for this one. And then for this one, we can say, let's negate the top one. So this little bubble here is a symbol of negation when we are looking at a circuit. Do you guys remember the difference between a P transistor versus an N transistor? It's the bubble. 
at the gate, right? So typically, people think of one as turning on something. You're asserting something. So the AND transistor turns on when the input, when the gate is a one. So it does not have a bubble because you know, we are basically saying you know, your input is a one, and I want you to turn on. Yeah, people think of it as okay, that's pretty normal. But the P transistor is the opposite. Okay, the gate has to be a zero in order to make connection you know, with that transistor. So it is the negation. Okay, that's why it has a bubble. The bubble says if the input, if the gate is a zero. Negated, it becomes one, and that's when you turn on the the P transistor. That is the reason why we have a bubble for the P transistor, and there's no bubble for the N transistor. So everything that, there's a reason for all of these notations, and trying to understand the, the rationale behind the notation can be very helpful in understanding a lot of the other stuff. All right. So if that is done here, then I look at this expression. And I go like, hmm, okay, we take x negated, and then we take y non-negated, and we end the whole thing together. Okay, we can do that. Okay, so we just hook up x to the negated input, hook up y to the non-negated input, and now we have the left-hand side of the OR done. And then for the right-hand side, it's kind of the opposite. x is not negated, and then y is negated. Like so, and then the output of this OR is the actual correct result of the R of x y, and now we're done. This is called a half adder because it only performs half of the adding. What do you mean by half of the adding? So if I go back to the diagram from Monday, you know it would be easy to explain that. So oh, that's on a different. Nope. Okay, that's okay. We can find that. So on Monday we got this, I believe, and it has. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so the half adder is only completing one half of the operation. So uh, let me just use a mouse pointer here to designate what we're talking about. It's only completing this half here, or the top half, or the bottom half. So this is one half, and then this is the other half. So there are two halves of each column. The half adder is only completing one half of it. All right. So we'll get back to this picture later on, and we'll use a binary addition you know, example to illustrate the whole thing. So for now, we just switch back to the circuitry and go like, okay, we're done with the half adder. So when we're done with the half adder, do you think? Can you imagine what is the next circuit that I am going to make? If there's a half, there's a full adder, a whole adder. Okay, so we are going to create a full adder. So we go to project, we say add circuit, and call this one the full adder. And guess what? We are going to use to make up for the full adder. The half adder. How many of the half adders do we need to make to need to use to make up for one full adder? Two of them, yeah. See, the names are important. Okay, so now we pick out two of these half adders. Okay, so we know that we need at least two of these. So the next question is, hmm, but what would be the input to this entire circuit? So this time, it is important for me to designate here you know, the labels. So one is x i. Okay, this is the actual input. You know, as one digit of the number that we are adding. And then we'll need y i. Okay, so these two are kind of expected you know, as inputs. So this is y i. But there's a third one. Okay, we actually have three input pins in this case because the third one is k i. Now q i is not an input because we can compute q i using x i y i. But k i is an input. Because it is determined by the earlier columns, or I should say, the columns to the right-hand side. So, to the, a particular column, you know, ki is dependent on the earlier you know, ki. So, it is an input. What about the outputs? Okay, so the output of the circuit uh, one is going to be the actual answer, which is si. That's the sum, and then the other one 
is Ki plus 1. Okay, so the Ki is actually going to cascade all the way down. Okay, I'll explain you know, what is cascading you know, in the picture in just a moment, but this is Ki plus 1. I cannot do subscript you know, using this notation. Mm -hmm. So just imagine the I plus 1 is subscript um, and not like on the, at the same level. Okay, so with all this, okay, the first thing we need to do is to say uh, we kind of need the Q of I, okay, because Q of I needs to be combined with K of I to do something. So what do I do? Well, one thing I did not do is to label the circuit. Because now I look at the half adder and I go like, I cannot remember which one is which one. Which one is, uh, is the C and which one is the R. I cannot remember. That's okay. We can always go back and kind of make sure that we document it correctly. So we go back to the... Um, this is the half adder. No, this cannot be the half adder. Okay, we double click first, right? Double click and then we go into this view. And if you cannot remember which one is which one, there's an easy way to uh, kind of help you remember. You long click a pin. So if you long click a pin, do you see a picture in picture at the lower right hand side? So that tells you that highlights the actual input pin corresponding to the pin on the packaging of the chip. So if you ever move things around and you cannot remember which one is which one, this is how you can figure out which one is which one. So now we can label this as one of the inputs. And I should not use XY anymore because XY has a special meaning because we have a row called X and then we have a row called Y. So I'm going to change the name to maybe use um, U and V, okay? So U, V are not used you know, anywhere within this discussion. So I'm just going to call one is U and the other one is V. And then this is now the top one is C of U, V. And then the bottom one is R of U, V. So U, V is really just a way to label the input. Um, it really has no particular special meaning in this context. So all I'm trying to do here is just so that I can tell you know, which pin is which pin. And it would be more obvious to you, you know, how to you know, make the connections as we get to the full ad. So are we, are we okay with this part here? So all the text here, you know, U, V, C of U, V, R of U, V, those are all not important as far as connectivity of the circuit is concerned. But it is important in the sense that we are documenting the circuit so that when I'm using the circuit, it's easy for me to tell which pin is which pin. So now, if I go back to the full adder, I now have documentation. So this is the cool part of the you know, Logisim and any type of tool you know, of this nature, is if you change how a circuit is defined, including the appearance, it will make all of those changes on the fly as well. Okay, it's both a good thing and a bad thing, because you know, if you already have made connections and you move the locations of the pins, it's gonna cause problems. All right, so we'll make some connections. Um, all right, the first thing we need to do is to compute Q of I. Can someone tell me how we can make connections so that we have Q of I computed? And I'm, I'm just gonna focus on the top one, okay? Yeah, because we have two identical components here. We'll just focus on this one. Yeah, using this component, how do I make connections so that I can have Q of I computed? Yep, go ahead. Yes, that is correct. So we hook up, you know, X I to U, Y I to V. And then the R of those two is my Q. But I don't need to connect it to a pin because the use of Q of I is entirely internal. In other words, now that I have Q of I, which is you know, the pin that I'm in progress of connecting to something else, how do I make use of Q of I? If you look at the equation that we got earlier and also introduced on Monday, how do we make use of Q of I? Okay, let me switch back to today's note. <clears throat> so 
go back. Notepad two. There we go. Okay. The only place we make use of QFI, well, not the only place, but one place is here. So, hmm. So that means QFI needs to connect to where? The other half, okay, as one of the inputs so that we can get the C out of it, right? Okay, so looking at this, so we switch back to Logisim again. So now this becomes the input. Okay, I'll space out things a little bit better because otherwise you know, it, it gets a little busy and it's harder to read. So I'm going to connect this one. I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, what is the best way to do this? This is Q. And K connects here. Okay, if you guys do not like things to overlap, you know, I can do this without overlapping by running around the whole thing. You know, that's okay. No one says I cannot do that, right? All right. So now we have K of I going to U. And then we have Q of I, this entire wire around the whole thing. Let me document it. So this way it's clear that this is Q of I. So we have Q of I going into V of the second half adder. Okay. So now we have everything that we need to do all the computations that we need. Um, so we'll focus on K of I plus one. Okay. Which is what do we hook up to here? So go back. we go back to the circuit first. And we go back to the circuit. We go like... Okay, we got this, okay, from the first circuit. C of X, I, Y, I is the C, U, V of the top of the top of your half uh, adder. And then we got this too, because this is the, uh, the C, U, V of the bottom, you know, half adder. So what we need now is really just a logical and, I mean, logical or, and then the output of the logical or becomes K of I plus one. So let's get this one done first. Okay, so we'll go back to the circuitry here. And then we just need to get an OR gate. Okay, that's another way to make an OR gate. Um, and then we make it smaller like so. And then we say, okay, the output of the OR gate is K of I plus one. The question is, what are the inputs to the OR gate? Can someone tell me you know, what I just said? Because I already said what we need to do. It should be pretty obvious. Yep. The two C values. Yep. The two C U V values need to go to the inputs of the OR gate. So this one here is the AND between X I Y I. Oh, that's not what I meant to do. Ah, okay, undo, undo. There we go. So this pin goes here. And then the this one is the AND between the Q I K I. So this goes to the other end. Like so, so now I, I got K of I plus one done. And we still have one output pin here that is not used. And this input, this output pin is also missing its own connection. So what do you think we should do? Yep, just hook them up. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Oh, uh, why did I route the wires this way? It's okay. In this class, we are going to emphasize the philosophy of ugly is not wrong. <laughs> the circuit still does what it's supposed to. It just looks, it just looks a little ugly. That's all. Now we have full adder, okay, for one single bit. Okay. Are we doing okay so far with all of this? Okay. So now the next question is. Can we actually build a circuit that adds something? Mm, yeah, I think so. I mean, the first thing we need to do is to go back here and change the appearance of the circuit just so that you know we document it when we you know, kind of make the connections. We know which one is which one. So we will document uh, XI, YI, uh, KI, K of I plus one, and also SI, which is the sum. And now it, I just have to move them around until they look right. So we know XI go here, YI goes here, K of I goes here, 
and the k of i plus one, I think, okay, I cannot remember. And that's why this tool is really helpful. This is k of i plus one down here, and then this is s of i. Okay, so now we have one full adder, okay? One adder for one single bit, which basically corresponds to an entire column when we perform multi-digit addition. And then the next thing we need to do is to go back to main and make use of those things. So let's just say that we're making a three bit by three bit adder. So that means I have X being three bit wide. So we change the data bits to three and then I duplicate this and then call the second one the Y. So this one is Y. It also has three bits. Um, I also need K0 to be an input. You go like, but isn't that assumed to be zero? It is for the most part, okay? But I'm going to make it an input pin because once I turn it into an input pin, I can now daisy chain the three bit adders. So I can daisy chain once to get a six bit adder. Then I can daisy chain two six bit adders to get a 12 bit adder. Then I can daisy chain two 12 bit adders to become a 24 bit adder and so on. So the Treating K0 as an input allows us to stack these designs to make longer chains of adders. So that's why it is helpful to look at K0, not as a special case, as in you know, it is just a zero all the time, but as an input pin. The output of this entire circuit is going to have the sum. Okay, So the sum is going to have the same number of bits as the input, which in this case is 3. But we are also going to have an overall carry out, okay? You know, which is the dangling k bit that is that does not go into the sum. So we'll also have to use that one. And this one, I don't really have a special name for it. We'll just call it k out. Or in this specific case, you can also call it k three because it really is k three. It is the fourth um, bit, you know, of k. You know, uh, but since we count from zero, it is k three. I will just call this K out. If I call this K out, it makes sense to call this not K zero, but K in, carry in. So we'll just call it, you know, we'll call it K in here, we'll call the other one K out. All right, so now what do I need to do? Without even thinking about the full adders, okay? You look at this and go like, well, but X is a multi-bit thing and the full adder expects things to be in single bits. Are we doing okay so far with that concept? The input pin and output pins, or all except for two of the pins, uh, are single bit, but everything else are multi-bit. They're all three bit wide. The full adder can only deal with one bit at a time as input and output. So what do you think we definitely need first? A splitter, okay, or splitters in this case. Every single time we want to deal with a multi-bit thing, we need a splitter in this case. So now we go to wiring. Actually, I think we need to take row. Okay, so we'll take a pause here, you know, and then take row first. So I'm switching back to the browser. And then we'll go ahead and take row for today. Today is the 30th. I will show you the uh, row taking word. It's forgotten. Okay, and then we can publish this. Oh, I forgot to set a time limit. Oh, I did. Okay. It's already past the time limit, so you won't be able to do it. I'll give you until 45. Give me a second here. All right. Now you can do it. Go ahead. Go ahead and refresh. And then the access code is forgotten. It's a joke. When people ask you what's your password, you say forgotten. We go like, really? Yes, I forgot. It's forgot. It is forgotten. The password is forgotten. Alrighty. All right, 
So it looks like most people are done with that. All right, so getting back here, we need splitters, okay? So we will pick out a splitter and say, okay, I'll let you guys tell me what we should use, okay? What do you think should be the fan out? The fan out is basically the number of split ends of the splitter. So how many do we need? Go ahead. Three, very good. Okay, so we need three for the output or the split end. What about the bit width? The bit width is referring to the number of bits of the merged end of the splitter. So what should that be? It's also three, okay? Because the input pins and output pins, they are all three bit wide, or the ones that are multi-bit are all three bit wide. So this is what we need, okay? And we need three of these because we have three pins that are three bit wide. So each one will require one of these. So we'll just use Control D to duplicate this. And now we have three of those. And this one here, you know, requires it to be flipped around. So we are just going to uh, change the facing from east to west, like so. And then we just bring it here. So now we just have to figure out how to compute S0, S1, S2. And then from the other perspective, we can now split X into X0, X1, X2. And we can also do, uh, let me move things around just a little bit here. Okay, we need more space. And this one goes here. All right. So now we got most of the things done. We have individual bits now. We have, okay, I'm just going to point out. We have x0, x1, x2, y0, y1, y2. We have carry in, which is basically k0. And then we have s0, s1, s2. And this is the overall carry bit, which is, you know, in this case, k3. And what else do we need? The full adders, because that's kind of the whole point of making the full adders. Okay, how many of the full adders do you think we need? Yes, it is also three. Very good. So now we go back to our own full adder here, and we just say, okay, we need three of these. So control D, doo -doo, doo -doo, like that. Control D, one more, like so. Okay. All right. So now that we have everything, all the components are on the table, the only thing left for us to do is to wire them up. Okay. Well, I think certain things are pretty clear. The X goes to X, the Y goes to Y, right? Because the X and the Y are the input numbers. You know, those are the numbers that we're supposed to be adding. So we just go like, okay, you are bit zero, you are bit one, and you are bit two, okay? So you can label those two because you can you know, have a label. Do not use the shared label. Use label itself, and you can say this is bit zero, and this is bit one, and this is bit two. But I'm not going to do that, you know, just because you know that's just that you, it uses up extra space that really should is not needed. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to Y up. Okay, X zero goes to the adder responsible for bit zero, and then Y zero goes to the Y input or the Y I input of the same adder, and then the same thing for bit one. This one goes down to here. Uh, remember, you know, uh, I have the recorder turned on, and you know, uh, so you don't have to be too busy copying this. Instead, you know, it's better to focus on the concept. All right, and now we deal with bit two. Now this circuit may not be the best looking adder, but I think it's going to work. Okay. Here, okay, and we also know the sum bits are all going to the sum pin, so that means you know, all the SI pin goes to the sum pin. This is for responsible for bit zero, so it, go, it goes to bit zero of the output. This is for bit one, and this is for bit two. All right, and then the overall carry is k of i plus 1 of the last bit. So this one goes to carry out. 
Okay, so we are almost done, but you can still see that there are some pins unconnected and red wires and also orange wires are never good, okay? So the question is, ah, so now what do we do? Let's see. So we only have the K of I and the K of I plus one left. So for the first, um, for this circuit here, this is corresponding to when I equals to zero. This corresponds to when I equals to one, and this corresponds to when I equals to two. Remember how we numbered the columns, right? So I equals to zero is the left, uh, the rightmost column, and then we have the middle column in this case with I equals to one, and then the rightmost column, leftmost column, left most column has I equal to two. Okay, now the I plus one makes sense, right? Because this K of zero is the input from here. This is K zero. So it goes all the way to become K of I when I equals to zero. And then this K I plus one, remember, I equals to zero, so I plus one is one. So this really is K of one. This is for column for the column when I equals to one. So this K of I is K of one. Oh, okay. So that means you know, this output here needs to connect to, uh, okay. Either way, I have to cross over. So I'm gonna cross over this way now, like that. And then this is going to, same thing, okay. It is going to connect to uh, K of I of the next column, like so. And now we have a three bit by three bit adder. I don't trust that. You know, how do we test this circuit? Try some numbers. We can plug some number in, okay, which is not exhaustive, right? You know, but we can at least uh, get a sense of whether it's working or not. Well, guess what? We are looking at one test case right now when we are adding zero to zero. Because what we have here is x is zero, zero, zero as a binary number. Even if you cannot remember how to do base conversion, you probably would understand that regardless of the base, zero, zero, zero is probably just zero as a value, right? So now what do we have? We have zero plus zero equal to zero. I don't think anyone's going to argue and say that's not that's not right. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do some more. Okay, so we'll do some more by hand first. Okay, and then we'll plug it into the circuit to see if the circuit is doing it also correctly. Um, one more question: If I only have three bits, okay, what is the range of value that I can represent? We have zero, 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 and the largest one is what? The largest value um, in base two as a three-bit number, what, what would that look like? It would be one, 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 because one is the highest value per digit. It's kind of like 999 in base 10, but in base two, one is the highest value that you can have for each digit. So one, one, one is really, that's all we can do. But what is the value represented by 111 as a binary number? Seven, exactly, because we have 11, one, 12, one, one, and 14. Four plus two plus one is seven. Okay, so let's go ahead and see if we can do a two plus five. Two plus three, sorry. So two plus three is a five, you know, that's, that we know in base 10. The question is, what does two look like as a binary number? It's one zero, okay, so it is zero, one, zero, that's base two. And what does three look like as a base two number? Zero, one, one, because it has one, one, and one, two, and none of the four, so it is zero, one, one. So now we do this addition, remember the X, the Y, the Q, the K, and also finally the S, okay? So we are gonna do this, but this time we're gonna use the binary way of doing things. So the Qs are just the exclusive ORs. Exclusive OR simply means the two inputs are different. In other words, when one is one and the other one is a zero, the exclusive OR is a one. If both are zero or when both are ones, then the output is going to be a zero. So knowing that we know this is a one, this is a zero, this is a zero. Okay. 
The K is a little bit more troublesome because in this case we do have to kind of put a zero here. And then we have zero plus one, okay? The first column, let me use my mouse pointer. Zero plus one does not have a carry of one. One plus zero also does not have a carry of one. So now we have zero or zero, meaning this is going to be a zero. Then we look at this, we have one plus one, which already has a carry of one. And now we have to look at, oops, I just clicked the wrong button. There we go. So the S bit is also the exclusive, exclusive OR between the Q and the K. So we have a one here, we have a zero here, and then we have a one here. And then the K3 is going to be a zero because zero plus zero does not have a carry, or I should say zero and zero does not, is not a one. Zero and one is also not a one. So now we have zero or zero, and that that's why we have a zero here. All right, so having done this in by hand, now I plug in zero, one, zero, and zero, one, one, and also zero as the input, and see whether we get one, zero, one as the sum, and the zero as carry out, okay? So that's one way to test the circuit. And x is 0, okay, we need to change to the poking tool. x is 0, 1, 0, and y is 0, 1, 1. And the output is indeed 1, 0, 1 with an overall carry of 0. Now, does that prove the circuit is right? No. Mm -mm. It just shows that it works for this specific case. Now, how many cases can you feed into this circuit to fully test that the circuit works in every single case? It's a little more than that. <laughs> so what you do is you look at the number of inputs, okay, the number of bits as inputs. How I partition the bits does not even matter, okay? So in this case, we got three bits here as X, we got three bits here as Y, and then one extra bit as k in or k0. So we have a total of seven bits. So that means there are two to the power of seven, which is 128 possible ways to, ar to arrange the zeros and ones for all of these seven bits. So I have to make sure that for every single one of those, the output bits, you know, there are four of those, are all correct. And uh, the test the test circuit, the test driver thing, was built for something like this. It basically you know, has a component that will store the pattern to serve as the input to a circuit being tested, and then the output goes to an output pin, and that is logged as an output, as a text file. So this way, when I build the circuit correctly, I would log my text file, and then when your output does, is exactly the same, that means for every single possible input case, your circuit is doing it correctly. And if you have some rows that are different, that means, you know, okay, for certain cases, it is not working and we have to find out why that is the case. All right, so um, that's basically the end of the lecture today. Um, and there's a lot of stuff to sink in to really understand, to make connections between. What is understanding? What does understanding itself mean? I was about to say, you know, do you understand what is understanding? But that would be kind of a chicken and egg kind of thing. <laughs> so what does understanding mean to you? I think that's probably the best way to phrase it. Making connections between concepts, preferably in a logical way. So that is what we need to do. And today we introduce a lot of concepts, right? So we, begin, we began with the concepts of the R and the C function that we talked about on Monday. And then we say, oh, it's easy to switch everything from base 10 to base 2. Just ten, change the, the constants of 10 in the functions. And we instantly have a base 2 way of performing addition, preserving the structure okay, of how the bits relate to each other. So that's, we are all done there. Unfortunately, if you are implementing an adder, and you need to rely on the add operator, then we have a problem. It's a chicken and egg thing. So we need to somehow 
translate everything into logical operations. And that's why we looked at the truth table and go like, oh, we recognize that one. That's an easy one. This one, not so easy, but we can still do it. We can still use an expression that is Boolean that will give us exactly the same result as the R function. So that was the first step. And then we looked at the C function, how they are utilized to compute the K bit. And we go like, wait, there's one little thing here. There's still an addition here. But can we replace that addition with an or? Because if they are the same for three of the four cases, if we can show that the fourth case will never show up, then we can just use a logical or instead of arithmetic addition. So that's why we have that longer truth table with eight items to show that, nope, those two sides of the operator will never be once at the same time, which means, oh, I can just use a logical or. So now that we have everything expressed in logical gates or logical operations, then the next exercise was this, okay, which is, okay, can we build a circuit to do it? And the answer is, yeah, we can build a circuit to do it. Okay, it takes a little bit of time to build up the sub-circuits, you know, to kind of make all the connections, but the connections just reflect the equations. Okay, every single thing that we did here is a reflection of the equations, okay, the way we defined the relationship between the bits. The next, in the next class, okay, we'll talk about how do we make this faster? What do you mean by faster? Aren't computers supposed to be fast to begin with? Well, the answer is yes. The problem here has to do with uh, carry propagation because we have to make sure that this carry bit is done before this carry bit can be trusted, okay? In other words, there's a particular sequence that we have to do things. This full adder has to be completely done before this full adder can start. Now, they're all kind of working at the same time. It simply means that whatever result is coming out of this adder here is not correct until this guy is done. So now we have a linear dependency, which means a 32-bit adder is gonna take twice the time of a 16-bit adder. And the, uh, a 64-bit adder will take twice the time of a 32-bit adder. Now, if this is really the true nature of things and you can't do anything about it, no problem, okay? But the problem is we can not actually do something about it. It's not our problem. It's the problem of Intel versus AMD. Because if Intel says, oh, this is the way I'd like to do it because it's nice and clean and easy to look at, and then AMD says, oh, but I can come up with a way to do this much faster, then Intel has to do it the faster way too. So as it turns out, this linear dependency can be removed. There's a trick to do it. And that is uh, section six of the notes. It talks about you know, how do we break the linear dependency or you know, the propagation. This is called carry ripple, okay? Because it's kind of like throwing a rock into a pond. You know, there's a ripple effect here. Um, so we can actually turn this design around in a certain way, making it much more complicated, but we can do a constant time adder. So regardless of how many bits we are adding, it will still take quote unquote constant time. So that is the topic of next Monday. Now that topic really cannot start, okay, until we fully understand all the concepts that have been introduced already. So on next Monday, I think the first thing I should do is to give you guys examples of your binary multi-digit addition, just so that we feel comfortable with this method here. And then we'll start to look at the math behind the whole thing and then go like, oh, we can actually do all of these things here. So that's kind of the uh, little forecast of what we're gonna do on next Monday, which is also to emphasize the importance of making all the connections of all the concepts that we have already been introduced, because without that, it would be really hard to build additional concepts on top of that. All right, so we do have a lab today, and let me show you the lab passcode, and it can be a slightly longer lab, and it depends on the math, okay? It depends on how comfortable you are with math. And you cannot see it yet, you know, it's right here. I'll give you the access code, and then I will un unhide it so that you guys can all do it. So, 
I cannot remember the access codes. That's why I have to look at it too. Okay, it's part of settings. The access code are the uh, letters for all the rows. Okay, so it's X, Y, Q, K, S. Those are the names of the rows that we have talked about. So if you look at these letters and you instantly recognize and go like, oh, those are the names of the labels of the rows, that's great. Okay, that's, you know, that, that's, that should give you a sensation of, oh, okay, I'm doing okay in this class. I'm, I'm keeping up with the material. All right, so I just have to unhide it and you guys can get started. There we go. I have just unhidden the, the addition lab. And there's a lot of math stuff in it. You know, so, you know, I will be here to answer questions. Or you can take a short break if you want. Um, you know, I am going to get some water from my office. And you know, stop the recorder and upload it. <laughs>